contribution of God's gift today, and subsequently we'll look at the corruption of men's work, the cre creative act of the Savior, and the, cre the conduct of the saved. Our first study, as I said, was focused on contours of saving grace. Our next study was actually the concept of saving grace. And then on yesterday, we looked at the conduit of saving faith. The conduit of saving faith. And we looked at faith as a channel of the means of our salvation. And so, as the channel of our salvation, there were four important things about faith, biblical faith, New Testament saving faith that we looked at. First, the origin of saving faith is God. The object of saving faith is God. The organization of saving faith, we look at three constituent elements of saving faith. What are they? Content, what's the next one? Consent was the last one, commitment. And then finally, we look at the outcome of saving faith, that we will be justified, reconciled, sanctified, and glorified as we express our faith in Jesus Christ continuously. Well, today our study is titled, The Contribution of God's Saving Gift. The contribution of God's saving gift. And our study is based on Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8. Kindly turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8. And as you flip the pages of your Bibles, permit me to again affirm my belief in the Bible as the Word of God. Brothers and sisters, I believe the primacy of the Bible, that the Bible is the ultimate authority. If you believe that with me, can't let's say amen. I also believe the sufficiency of the Bible, that the Bible is sufficient to make one wise unto salvation. If you believe that with me, can't let's say amen. I also believe the totality of the Bible, that all scripture, comprising the Old and New Testaments and 66 books is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man or woman of God may be thoroughly furnished for all good works. If that is what you believe, can the shout a mighty amen. With that conviction, I wish to read to your hearing Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. We're going to read together for the first time, and I'll read to your hearing uh, subsequently. Ready, go. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Let me read to your hearing. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Once more, the message is captioned, the contribution of God's saving gift. Let's ask the Lord to lead us as we study his word. Father, we thank you that the moment has come that we hear your wonderful word of life. Oh, loving Father, Give us hearts that are receptive to your redeeming word. Loving Father, speak to us pointedly, powerfully, and personally. And as it has pleased you, O God, to use a frail, a filthy, and a feeble person like me. I do not ask for mighty words of human wisdom to move the crowd. Oh, I ask, oh Lord, let humanity diminish and let divinity dominate in the name of Jesus. Let God's people say amen. The contribution of God's saving gift. We are still in the first verse of our theme text, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to 10. So we are still in the if verse of this text. 
And the if verse says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. My dear brothers and sisters, today we will look at two important and fascinating truths about, you know, the line, and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. That is the clause that we will analyze today. And that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It's going to be our focus uh, in uh, today's study. And we are going to look at two important points based on that particular portion of the text. Number one, we will consider the refutation of man's contribution to his salvation. The refutation of men's contribution to his salvation. Number two, we'll look at the country or the revelation of God's contribution to men's salvation. The revelation of God's contribution to men's salvation. Those are the two points that actually our study is delineated by on today. But just before we go there, let's settle a little problem in the text. Look at the text again. The text says, by grace, you have been saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. My dear brothers and sisters, the problem we need to solve in the text is, what is the antecedent of the demonstrative pronoun, that? What is the antecedent of the pronoun, eight? What is that referring to? So we say, what's that? And what is eight? What's that? And what is eight? In other words, what actually is that referring to in that particular passage? Is it referring to grace? Then grace is the gift of God. If it is referring to faith, then faith is the gift of God. What precisely is it referring to in the text? There are some who have opined that the, prep, the pronoun actually is referring to that. Some have actually also argued that it is referring to, you know, uh, faith. Okay? The pronoun is referring to grace. Some say it's referring to faith. So what is it referring to in the sentence? My dear brothers and sisters, there are two important keys I'd like to share with us that will help us to understand what the gift from God is. Whether it is faith or it is grace or it is something else in the passage. The first important key I would, I would love to share with you is the key of context. The key of context. That is for us to consider the immediate context of the text. We need to know what is the subject of the immediate context. Now, the immediate context of Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 is actually Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10. In Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10, the apostle is discussing salvation. If you are there with me, say amen. If you look at verses 1 to 3, he tells us what we wear before meeting Christ, who we wear before Christ. In verses 4 to 7, he tells us what God did for us and what we have become as a result of that. In verses 8 to 10, he explains the grace of God. So the entire passage, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, discusses salvation. That's the immediate context. Also, if you look at the structure of Ephesians chapter 2, okay, and you look at the immediate clause before the expression and that, not of yourselves, the discussion or the theme or the subject is also salvation. For instance, it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Before you come on to say, and that not of yourselves. So the immediate clause is also dealing with salvation, the subject of salvation. That is the first point. The second key I wish to give you is called the grammatical key. 
the grammatical key. Now look at this carefully. In Greek, or the syntax of the Greek language, uh, they actually have genders to match pronouns. Okay? It matches gender of pronouns to the antecedent that it refers to. So, for instance, if you say, Gemini wife is Corina, you cannot say, it is a beautiful woman. That is wrong. Are you there with me? Because Corina is feminine, you must use a feminine pronoun to refer back to her. So, Gemini has a beautiful wife. She is called Corina. Are you there with me, everyone? So, you use she because that's the feminine. In the same way, in the Greek, the pronoun must agree with its antecedent in gender. Now, here is the problem. Look at the screen carefully. You will notice that grace, as used in the text, has a grammatical gender of feminine. Then faith, as used in the text, has the grammatical gender of feminine. Then that, which is the demonstrative pronoun, has the grammatical gender of neuter. And then their gift also has a grammatical gender of neuter. Therefore, grammatically, that cannot be referring to grace. It cannot be referring to faith. Though I actually believe that grace is the gift of God, faith is the gift of God. But in the context of Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, that is referring to salvation as a whole. Salvation in totality. In fact, this is the common gender that is used, that is the neuter gender. It is often used when a phrase or a clause is the antecedent. So when the text says, and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It is referring to salvation in toto salvation in its entirety. So salvation is exclusively a gift of God. If that is clear, say amen. So it is plausible to believe that this or that, the demonstrative pronoun in that sentence in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 refers to the whole previous clause, by grace you have been saved through faith, which is dealing with the subject of salvation. So salvation, brothers and sisters, in its entirety is the gift of God. So it is on the basis of this that God says two things in the text to us. The first is the refutation or the negation of man's contribution to his salvation. Look at the text again with me. The Bible says, and that not of yourselves. Not of yourselves. That means... That not of yourself means literally, absolutely not out of yourselves. Absolutely not out of yourselves. It is a negation. God is negating or he is refuting any kind of belief that makes man to be the author of his salvation or a contributor to his salvation. Brothers and sisters, why is it? That God refutes any possibility or even probability that man would save himself from in himself. Why is God refuting this? Brothers and sisters, there is a reason for that. And that reason is self-salvation is silly. Self-salvation is silly and futile. Notice what the Bible says. When man fell in the Garden of Eden, the Bible says he was naked. Adam and his wife were naked. And notice what they did in order to cover their nakedness. Remember, they were naked because the glory of God had been taken away. They became aware of their nakedness. And so the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3 verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. 
There you are. Notice what they did. In order to shield or to cover their nakedness, the Bible says they sealed fake leaves together and made themselves covering. Take note of they sealed fake leaves and take note of they made themselves covering. Adam and his wife decided to compensate for their nakedness they, to compensate for their separation from God with fig leaves. God, knowing the inadequacy of that action, knowing the futility of that action, knowing the silliness of that action, did something. Come with me over to Genesis chapter 3, verse number 21. Notice what the Bible says. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tonics of skin and clothed them. It's interesting. So we have two garments here now. The first one was self-made garment. The second one was God-made garment. Are you there with me, someone? The question is, the God-made garment was made of skin. Where do you think he must have taken the skin from? From Animal. From animal. So the skin with which they were covered may have been the skin of an animal that may have been slain. Slain by God. God is basically saying to Adam and his wife that you cannot compensate for your nakedness. You cannot save yourself. I am your only savior. So every effort of man to seek salvation by himself is futile and very much unwise. So in, in Christianity, salvation is something that is initiated by God. If that is clear, say amen. Jesus is the author of our faith. He is the originator of our faith. Christianity stands to be a unique religion, a religion in this regard. Why is it? Because, brothers and sisters, in uh, uh, Zoroastrianism, the person has to win the struggle over evil in order to be saved. In Judaism, you must obey the Jewish law and customs to be saved. In Islam, you must actually practice the five pillars successfully to be saved. In Hinduism, the individual must purify himself from evil in life after death and so on in order to be saved. In uh, sarcasm, uh, a proper worship and conduct must be performed in order to be worthy of salvation. In Confucianism, heaven on earth is possible, but only through personal conformity to the rules of society. In Shantuism, you must maintain Japanese supremacy at all costs. And then in paganism, you must appease the gods and spirits in order to be rewarded. But in Christianity, it is God God who is initiating our salvation. In almost all world religions, you have to do something to appease the deity. It could be bringing a sacrifice to the deity. It could be bringing an animal to the deity. It could be bringing a relative to the deity. Bringing a child to the deity. But in Christianity, God provided for himself that which would appease his wrath against us. So when later Isaac, Isaac asks his father, I see the firewood. I, 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 I see the, 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 the other things. But where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abraham said, son, God will provide himself a lamb. That's a powerful prophetic statement. God will provide himself a lamb. And as Abraham lifted up his head, he saw a ram stuck in the tucket. God had provided. And so he said, Yahweh, Jara. God, our provider. He is our righteousness. If that is clear, say amen. But brothers and sisters, we are not saved by our works. 
why is it, it, uh, uh, why is it silly for us to make effort to save ourselves? As a matter of fact, why is it impossible for man to save himself? God found that problem. Notice this. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29. God had given the law to the children of Israel. He, Moses reiterated the giving of the law in Exodus, and then the children of Israel called Moses, and they said to him, we have heard God speak, we saw the thunder, we saw the mighty fire, and listen, this is what we are requesting of you, Moses. Moses said, what is that? He said, they said to him, next time, let God speak to you. We don't want him speaking to us directly anymore. Whatever he tells you, that we will do. So when Israel said, whatever you say to us, we will do. Listen to what God's response was. Here is God's response. God said, oh, that they had such a heart in them. Oh, that they had such a heart in them. In fact, when you read the preceding verses, God said what they were saying is true. It means they were desirous of doing those things that they said they wanted to do. But he says, oh, that they had the capacity that they had a heart that was able to do this. That they would fear me and always keep all my commandments. That it might be well with them and with their children forever. Dear brothers and sisters, what God is saying is that, oh, humanity's heart is depraved. And basically he is saying that the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. The heart of humanity's problem is the problem of humanity's heart. In other words, we are depraved. Something is wrong essentially with our hearts. Notice what the Bible says, Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 13 verse 23. The Bible says, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may you also do good who are accustomed to do evil. Meaning that just as the leopard cannot change the color of his skin and the Ethiopian cannot change his dark skin, you cannot do good because you are accustomed to doing evil. Furthermore, the Bible says, dear brothers and sisters, in the book of uh, Genesis, in Genesis chapter 6 verse 5, the Bible says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of men was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was evil continually. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It speaks of the bent the tendencies, the inclinations of the man's heart. We are depraved. Genesis chapter 8 verse 21, after the flood, the Bible says, and the Lord smelled that Moses, I mean, uh, uh, Noah offered uh, 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 a sacrifice to the Lord. And the Bible says, and the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the earth for men's sake, although Listen to this. The imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. The imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. We are depraved. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9. Jeremiah 17 verse 9. The Bible speaks of the unregenerate man's heart. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The Bible also says, I mean, uh, 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 very clearly the scripture is telling us that our hearts are in the condition of depravity. We have bent. We are genetically engineered to seek evil, to be selfish. We are born with selfish inclination and evil tendencies. Perversion of our nature. Ellen White also has something to say about this. She says, we must remember very important, we must remember that our hearts are naturally depraved and we are unable of ourselves to pursue a right course. That's what she say. Of ourselves, we cannot go after that which is good. 
She also says the inheritance of children is that of sin. Did you get that? As related to the first Adam, men receive from him nothing but guilt and the sentence of death. We are born guilty. We are born with a sentence of death. We are born sold on the sin. Ellen White also says, as a result of Adam's disobedience, every human being is a transgressor of the law, sold on the sin. Depraved. And that is why we cannot save ourselves. That is why salvation is a gift of God. That is why he is the inaugurator. He is the initiator of salvation and not us. Brothers and sisters, that is God's refutation of men's contribution. Now, as we look at the text, we see the revelation of God's contribution. The revelation of God's contribution. Notice what the Bible says here. The Bible says, it is the gift of God. And that salvation is not of works. It is the gift of God. And that salvation is not of yourselves. You are not the originator. It doesn't originate in your heart because your heart is depraved. You cannot find it in yourself to save yourself. That, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Salvation is the gift of God. Dear brothers and sisters, what does this mean? In the New Testament, there are several words that are used to depict gift. But we'll look at two of them which are very vital for this discussion. These two words are charisma, okay, charisma and doria. Now, these are powerful words. Charisma is actually a gift of grace. A gift of grace. Or you can call it gracious gift. Serving gift gift. This word is used to define salvation in Romans chapter 5, verses 15 to 16. Also in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, when the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift, the charisma of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay? This same word is used in conjunction with the gifts of the Spirit given to the believer after salvation. After the person has been saved, God gives gifts. Romans chapter 12, verse 6. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. And 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. You find the gifts of the Spirit. The Spirit of God gives gifts for the running of the church, for the edification of the body of Christ, for the work of ministry. Those gifts are serving gifts. They are gracious gifts. They are God's charisma. Brothers and sisters, they are God's gift of grace. But there is another word which is used for gift in the Bible. And it is used in our text, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. And that word is doria. Doria means a free gift. Whilst charisma is actually a gift of grace, doria is a free gift. Gift. Whilst charisma is gracious gift, Doria is gratuitous gift. Whilst Doria is uh, 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 charisma is actually serving gift, Doria is saving gift. Saving gift. In fact, it is that gift that Jesus offers to the Samaritan woman at the well. He said, I'm going to give you water that it will actually be springs of eternal life for you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is called the free gift. In Romans chapter 5, verse 15, it is the unspeakable or indescribable gift. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15, it is this glorious gift that is identified as the Holy Spirit himself. Charisma is the gift of the Spirit. Doria is the gift of the Spirit. Uh, let me explain what that means. Charisma is the gift that the Spirit gives. Doria is the gift of the Spirit that God gives. 
In other words, God gave the Holy Spirit as a gift, a free gift to the believer to perfect his regeneration. If that is clear, say amen. In fact, the adverb form of Doria is Dorian. It's actually translated freely. 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 In fact, in Romans chapter 3, verse number 24, immediately following God's pronouncement that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we have this use again, Dorian. It says, being justified, Dorian. Being justified freely by His grace. Well, brothers and sisters, the point is, man cannot contribute to his salvation. So God refutes the possibility of man's contribution. And the point is, the soul, the only contributor to our salvation is God. Nothing we do relative to our salvation is meritorious. Meaning, no action of ours deserves to be merit or basis upon which God can save us. No! Salvation is the gift of God. And somebody may say, but why is it a gift? Why is it a free gift? I will tell you three reasons. How many reasons? Three reasons why salvation is the gift of God. It is the sole gift of God. And God is the sole contributor of our salvation. Three reasons. Reason number one. Salvation is the free gift of God because the Savior himself is God's gift. Are you there with me? Salvation is the free gift of God because the Savior himself is the gift of God. The Bible says, for God so what? Loved the word that he gave. The Savior is God's gift of love for our justification. The Savior, Jesus Christ, who accomplishes our salvation, is God's gift of love for our justification. Jesus is the gift of God for our justification. Why? Romans chapter 5 verse 9. Romans chapter 5 verse 9, the Bible says much more than having now been justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. We have been justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have been justified by God's gift of the Savior. Salvation is the gift of God because the Savior is God's gift of love for our justification. We did not produce the Savior. As a matter of fact, in Israel, there were many people who came up to be saviors. Bakubak said he was a savior. Even Barabbas wanted to be a savior. But God's accredited savior of the universe is his only begotten son, his unique son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If that is clear, say amen. Jesus, the savior, is the gift of God for our justification. Now take note of this. If you are taking notes, take this. The gift of the Savior is the expense of our salvation. The gift of the Savior is the expense, the cost that will pay for our salvation. The price that was paid for our salvation. The Bible says being justified by his blood. So Jesus became the expense of our salvation. Much more than having now been justified by his blood. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. The Bible says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus is the expense. Of our salvation. The expense. He is the prize that was paid for our salvation. Now let's go on. Why is salvation a free gift? It is a free gift because the Savior who initiates our salvation is a free gift of God. 
The second reason why salvation is a free gift is the spirit of God's gifts. The spirit is God's gift for our sanctification. In other words, salvation is the free gift because the spirit who applies salvation, the spirit who initiates, who applies salvation, the spirit who appropriates salvation, the spirit who applies the salvation of God to our hearts is a gift of God. Did you get that? Jesus is God's gift. All these spirit. God's gift. You see, Jesus died on the cross. He shed his blood. For you to recognize that fact of history and to apply that is not by yourself. It is by the Holy Spirit. When Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, he says he will come and he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So it is the Holy Spirit who woos us unto God, who invites us to God, and he does it through the preaching of the word, for the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And the Holy Spirit inspires people with the gift of the Spirit to proclaim the word of God. The Spirit is also the gift of God. And the Spirit is God's gift for our sanctification. Brothers and sisters, you want to know whether the Holy Spirit is gift? Luke chapter 11 verse 13. In Luke eleven thirteen, 13, the Bible says, If you then, be evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? So the Holy Spirit can be given as a gift. Are you there with me, brothers and sisters? The Holy Spirit is God's gift specifically for our sanctification. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, the Bible says, Elect according to the full knowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit. Sanctification of the Spirit. The Bible also says in 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 13. The Bible says, but we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit. Sanctification by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God's gift for our sanctification. Now listen to this. Was Jesus, or whereas Jesus is the what? He is the expense for our salvation. He is the price that was paid for our salvation. The Holy Spirit is the earnest of our salvation. Jesus is the expense. The Holy Spirit is the earnest. Is anybody here with me? I thought someone would be shouting a mighty amen. The Holy Spirit is the earnest of our salvation. Maybe when I explain earnest, you'll be fascinated as I am. Brothers and sisters, the word earnest is a powerful word used in the Bible. It is used in 2 Corinthians 1, 22. Where the Bible says, who has also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. The Bible also says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 in the New King James Version, it says the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. The Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, the Bible says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The Bible also says in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, In him... You also trusted. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee, the earnest, of our inheritance until the redemption purchased possession to the praise of his glory. That's powerful. The Bible says when we are saved, when we are justified by God, he sends the Holy Spirit to us as the earnest, as the guarantee of our salvation. The word earnest in the Greek is arabon. Arabon means earnest money. 
It is the money that is, that is deposited, you know, as a part payment by a purchaser for a particular, particular you know, uh, 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 item. So you want to buy land in Nairobi and you pay one million uh, 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 shillings, okay, as a part payment for that particular property. It is a guarantee to you that the property is preserved for you. It is also a guarantee to the person who is selling it that that property will be bought by you. So the Holy Spirit is the earnest money. He is the guarantee. He is the pledge that God will finish what he has started. In fact, it is also used to talk about guarantee of a promised marriage. So you meet a woman and you say, listen, I engage you. Engagement means I am promising you that I will marry you. In fact, recently I checked modern Greek. In the modern Greek language, today, today in Greece, if you go there, the word arabona is used to actually refer to engagement, the engagement ring. The engagement ring that is placed on the finger is called arabona. So the Holy Spirit has been giving to us as an arabona that we will marry Jesus someday. Are you there? Are you there? Are you there? He is saying, I have engaged you for the marriage supper. Of the Lamb. His bride will make herself ready through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Arabana. Every believer having the Spirit in your heart, you have the Arabana of God. You have the guarantee of God that you will be glorified, that you will be sanctified, that you will be saved. We have a guarantee that we will go to heaven. Oh, brothers and sisters, listen to this. Salvation is a free gift because the Savior who initiates our salvation is the gift of God. Salvation is a free gift of God because the Spirit who applies our salvation is the gift of God. Now let me become a little bit theological. The Son, the Savior. The Spirit, the Holy Ghost. In Liberia we can say, the God. That God means the Son is God. The Spirit is God. God wants to make this salvation to be so exclusively initiated and applied by Him that He did not use anything else in nature. He did not use an angel. He used Himself. So God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God is in the Holy Ghost calling the world to himself. It is God from beginning to end. Hallelujah. Here is my final point. Why? Salvation is a free gift of God. It is a free gift of God because even the sinner's response to God's gift of salvation is God's gift. Did you get that? Even the sinner's response to the gift of God is the gift of God. Hallelujah. I'm getting excited here. You didn't get that. Salvation is a free gift because even the response of the sinner to this free gift is a gift which is, which is given by God. And how do we respond to God's gift? We respond through repentance. Repentance is the gift of God. We respond through faith. Faith is the gift of God. Jesus is the author of our faith. Brothers and sisters, listen. I say repentance is the gift of God. Repentance is God's gift for our return to him. The Bible says in Acts chapter 11 verse 18, when they heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Repentance was given to Gentiles. Well, yes, another text. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 25. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 25, the Bible says, In humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so they may know the truth. Grant them repentance. Repentance is a gift of God. 
So if you become convicted of a sin in your life and you repent, in your prayer of repentance, say, God, thank you that I could even see this as a sin and repent because it is a gift of God. Hallelujah. Listen to what Ellen White says. She says, oh, that all may see that everything in obedience, everything in penitence, which is repentance, everything in praise and thanksgiving must be placed upon the glowing fire of the righteousness of Christ. Hallelujah. Everything we do must be placed upon the glowing fire of the righteousness of Christ. Ellen White also says, it is impossible for us of ourselves to escape from the pit of sin in which we are sunking. His grace alone can quicken the lifeless faculties of the soul and attract it to God to holiness. Ellen White also says repentance is beyond the reach of our own power to accomplish. It is obtained only from Christ who ascended on high. Ellen White also says man is not capable of originating such a repentance as this and can experience it alone through Christ. Ellen White also says our, I mean the Bible says in Ezekiel, yes, why repentance happened, Ezekiel chapter 36, Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27, the Bible says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit in you. And here's what I love. I will cause you to walk in my statutes. Even living righteously is caused by God. Because the Holy Spirit in us begins to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. The heart of our problem is the problem of our hearts. So God being a wise God said that in the new covenant, I will provide a recipe. I will provide a remedy for the reprobate hearts of men. I will provide a solution to the stoniness of men's heart. And that solution is the new heart. The new heart is called regeneration. That is what the Bible calls being born again. If you're in our midst and you have not been born again, Jesus wants me to tell you that you must be born again. You must be regenerated by the Spirit. It's also possible that as a believer, you can become so cold in your spirituality, so cold in your life, that your heart will need to be renewed. So David will say, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Create in me a clean heart. And today, you want to submit your heart to God. You want to commit your heart to God. I want to sing the singers, uh, the choristers to join us up here. And I don't know whether you can help us sing, Change My Heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. You're in this place, and choristers, can you join us up here? You're in this place, and you are saying, Lord, I want you to change my heart. I want you to renew my heart. I want you to clean my heart. I want to experience and embrace the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ. If you're in this place, we're going to pray together with you. Let us all stand as we pray. Let us all stand as we pray. The song says, change my heart, O God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O God. May I be like you. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. If that is your prayer today, lift up your hand. Lift up your hand. That is a prayer. You say, Lord, take my heart. Let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. That is a cry today. You say, in creating me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit. Spirit within me. Cast me not away from the presence. Take not the Holy Spirit from me. But restore unto me the joy of your salvation. That is your prayer today. Lift up your hand as we pray together. 
I'm going to ask Pastor Katati to kindly offer this prayer to God for the renewing of our hearts, for the cleansing of our hearts. Let's pray with Pastor. Our most gracious, dear, loving Father who art in heaven, we are so delighted to once again come before thy altar. Yes, we know we are sinners, but gracious Lord, as we come to you, we bow before thee, and here we fall at thy feet. That a gracious, dear Heavenly Father, as we seek for forgiveness, that you may forgive us of our trespasses. Gracious Lord, how we pray that you may regenerate our hearts. How we pray that you may translate each of us. How we pray that you may rejuvenate us. That gracious Lord, who is the initiator of the recipe of our salvation, that the Lord God in heaven, we may all of us embrace that salvation that you've extended to us. And so that, gracious Lord, we may be called your children. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who is the expense of our salvation. Thank you, our Lord, for the Holy Spirit that you've given us, that he may be our harness. May your name be glorified. Today, as we lift our hands before thee, Lord, we want to pray that may you please continue to initiate our salvation unto the end. That gracious Lord, as you promised us that you be with us unto the end, that Lord, we may continue to witness your greatness and your love for each of us. Thank you because we are faithful God. We continually present ourselves to you together with our families, our spouses, our children, that Lord, we may be made holy once more. Thank you. And thank you again. Thank you for your man's servant. Thank you for everything. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray and believe. Amen.